Seat again there. Thank you. Now, Ross Carberry was a very historic place. St. Faulkner founded the Abbey and School here back in the 6th century. The Vikings visited here in the 9th and 10th century. If you go to the cathedral, you see the names of the bishops, but one of them, Thomas Herlihy, went by foot to the Council of Trent in northern Italy in the 1500s. He brought his own cow from Ross Carberry. He didn't trust the foreign food. William Penn used to holiday as a young man at Castle Salem before he went on to found Pennsylvania in the States. The most famous local names are Michael Collins and Tom Barry due to their roles in 1916, the War of Independence and the Civil War. I'll just give a brief summary of the attack on the barracks. Tonight, 100 years ago, the volunteers assembled up in Cashel, about three miles northwest of here. I walked into the village via Castle Salem and the Bog Road down beside John Hodnitz. They took off their boots there and entered the square silently. They laid a bomb at the door of the barracks, and the barracks is actually just where Kilcora House is there now. And they had a bomb at the door with a 30 second fuse. When they detonated the bomb, the blast went outwards and took the roof off the houses there behind you. But the front door of the barracks wasn't breached. A firefight ensued for a few hours, but eventually the building caught fire and the RIC personnel escaped out the back and took refuge with the nuns at the Convent of Mercy. Sergeant Shea and Constable Bowles were killed during the, the attack. The following day, which is a market day, the square was a scene of devastation. Glass, masonry, roof slates everywhere. A child found a grenade and gave it to one of the auxiliaries who threw it against one of the walls of the barracks. George Wilson, Patrick Collins and young Cornelius Fitzpatrick were killed as a result of this. From that time until the truce, three months later, there were no Crown forces in Ross Carberry. Then in March 1922, Angarda Shikan was founded. This is the centenary year. I now ask Sup Superintendent Mackie to say a few words. Thank you very much indeed, Don. Um, Mayor Colin, Reverends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Um, firstly, I'm here representing Chief Superintendent Cadigan, who very much wanted to be here today, but unfortunately he's away for, at the moment for a few days, so he sends his apologies. Um, on Garish Akana are delighted to be associated with this event. Um, as Donna said, it's our centenary year. Um, 2022 since the establishment of the organisation. And I suppose it's, an import, it's important to reflect on the past as well as consider the, 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 the future and the, um, the future challenges. And if you don't know your past, it's difficult to, to, to know where you're going or to look to the future in confidence. And the, I suppose the remembrance event that we're here today for, it reminds us of the turbulence of the period and the circumstances which led to our foundation in 1922. It was a fraught time for Ireland. The new Irish Free State faced many challenges. The RIC had pleased Ireland for 100 years since 1822. They were about to be disbanded, leaving Ireland with no operating police service. Then on the 9th of February uh, 1922, Michael Collins held a secret meeting 
at room 85 of the Gresham Hotel in O'Connell Street, Dublin, with the view of this, uh, setting up um, a police organising committee. And the attendance at that included members of Sinn Féin, um, local councillors, and strangely enough, members of the RIC who were chosen for their professionalism, I suppose, and their loyalty and maybe their allegiances at that time, their expertise and the ability to quickly train the recruits to form a new police force for the fledging new Irish free state. The very first Garda Commissioner, Michael Stain, said at the time, the Garda Shikana will not succeed by force of arms or numbers, but on their moral authority as servants of the people. And I suppose this was one of the main differences between the two forces and what people were trying to achieve. You had the RIC, I suppose, which were primarily a military force who had become unacceptable to the vast majority of the people at that time, whilst they formed the Garish Akana as servants of the people. And this in our centenary year, uh, 100 years on, hopefully we, can fill it, can, we continue to fulfil our duties and responsibilities with this sentiment in mind. It's as relevant today as it was in 1922. And I suppose when we look back and we think back to 1922, we look at the complexities and the contradictions and associations that happened here 100 years ago now. You had General Tom Barry, um, the leader of the IRA at, 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 at the attack, a son of a serving RIC man, from a Killarglin County Kerry. And I've read about um, Ger McCarthy from Dreany Skibbereen, who was a member of the attacking force of the IRA, who later went on to join the fledging civil guard of Garda Shikana. So you had all these associations and relationships, and of course did many, um, what we'll say, former IRA men went on to join um, the Ungarda Shikana. And the, it's appropriate today that we remember Patrick Collins, Cornelius Fitzpatrick, a child of four or five years of age, George Wilson, Sergeant Ambrose Shea and Constable Charles Bowles, who lost their lives in this place in the course of the struggle for independence. It's part of our history, um, which we should never forget, and may they all rest in peace and be forever remembered by uh, those who unveiled this attack here today. Um, in our centenary year on Garish um, are, are very proud to be so associated with this event and um, thank you all very much indeed for attending today in such numbers. And I will ask uh, Flora McCarthy, who had relations on both sides, to say a few words. Um, thank you very much, Don, and uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you all very much for the lovely warm welcome. Um, <clears throat> I need my specs and some notes because uh, I'm going to uh, be hard to shut up on this one. Um, but I'll try and keep it as brief as I can. It's an absolute honour to be asked to say a few words at this important event to remember those who died 101 years ago um, as a result of the IRA attack on the RIC barracks here in Ross Carberry. The committee asked me to speak as, as Don said, I'm in the very unusual position of having family on both sides of this story here. Um, and so I am going to speak a little about the families of those who died and the importance of remembering them. In, in our own case, my mother's uncle, Ambrose O'Shea, was the RSE shot sergeant here in the barracks. He was aged 46 and with a wife and three young sons uh, in Baltimore. Um, Ambrose died, we think, instantly in the bomb blast in the early stages of the attack. And we'll hear a little bit more about him in a few moments. Um, on the other side, my father's uncle, Jeremiah McCarthy, also known as Jermac, also known as the Dauntless Man, uh, or as Tom Barry described him in his memoir, um, the Dashing Man. He was a young medical student at UCC. He was from Dreeny House outside Skibbereen. And he quit his studies to join the uh, 3rd Battalion, 4th West Cork Brigade, and with Tom Barry's flying column, staged the attack here on the barracks. These two men, my granduncles, um, had never met. We're the link between them with my parents' marriage in 1954. My brother Dan, who's over there hiding, 
Um, and I, we've been researching this story for the past few years. He wrote about it. We wrote about it for the centenary last year. As Dan said, he does the writing, but he volunteered me to talk here today. But it's very important to us that this is just one family story among so many thousands about the revolutionary era in our history. And after 100 years, we need to be able to tell these stories and to remember those who died. It is most of all a privilege to be here among the families of some of them. I think the committee chose the wording very well as we are remembering the people who died and their stories. We're not commemorating events, we're not celebrating anything, we are remembering. At the moment, President Michael D. Higgins has been hosting a series of seminars at our Sanuchtaron on the revolutionary period. It's entitled Machnav, which is a beautiful old Irish word for reflection. He says, the decade of centenaries allows us to revisit events of a century ago and to think afresh about our history, whether it's the 1913 lockout, the rising, the Spanish flu pandemic, or this event today, and to bring in those who may have been excluded from previous tellings of the stories. Historian Professor Yunan O'Halpin, who also is speaking at Machnav and who co-wrote a book um, two years ago with um, historian uh, Donika O'Karan, Dahi O'Karan, they listed 2,850 men, women and children who were killed uh, between the 1916 rising and the end of December in 1921. He says, and I think it's a great line, through the individual stories, we can deepen our understanding of the Irish Revolution itself. So... Some of those individual stories um, and about those who, who died. Um, as Don said, on the night of March the 31st, 1921, as the flying column was surrounding Ross Carberry in the darkness, Sergeant Ambrose O'Shea had gone to bed here in a downstairs office. Young Constable Charles Henry Bowles, who was apparently a very popular young guy around town, was also on duty. Perhaps they were safe in the knowledge that the barracks had been attacked twice already by the IRA and it was now deemed impregnable. Inside were two sergeants and 19 constables. The two who died on the night instantly, as we think, were um, Ambrose O'Shea, the RIC sergeant, my mother's uncle, and uh, young Charles Henry Bowles. Their bodies lay in the rubble for the night and were removed the next day. But the next day, the dying didn't stop there. There were more deaths, as in the aftermath of the attack, as we know, three civilians were killed. The Cork Examiner reported, but another appalling feature of the morning sensations were yet to come. This was fair day in Ross Carberry and the town was pretty well filled with buyers and country people, large numbers of whom had congregated in the vicinity of the wrecked barracks to view the scale of the night's startling events. A bomb was picked up amongst the smoking ruins by a young girl and a constable grabbed it from her and threw it away rapidly. It exploded nearby killing farmers John Collins and George Wilson, as well as toddler Francis Fitzpatrick, who was known as Frankie. A little bit of detail on those who died. Patrick Collins had been born in Derry Duff in about 1861. He was married to Ellen Hagerty from Millie Nahillen. Three children, Margaret, John and Matthew. Ellen had died almost exactly four years before, aged just 46. Now their father, Patrick, aged 60, also died and was buried in the Abbey. George Allen Wilson was born near Corran North on the 17th of September, my own birthday, in 1892. Not my own birthday, of course. Uh, married Sarah Jane Kingston in 1919 and they had one young child, just a baby. Um, George Allen Wilson is buried in Russ Carberry Churchyard. He was in his 20s. And little Frankie, Cornelius Francis Fitzpatrick, aged just four. Frankie had been born in the Square South here in Ross Carberry on the 24th of May 1917. He died at the Mercy Hospital on the 2nd of April 
1921. His parents were Cornelius Fitzpatrick and Mary Ellen Manny. His siblings, John, Kathleen, Nancy and Peg. The RIC in Ross Carberry, as Tom Barry himself, who was the son of an RIC man, as you'd know, and who had grown up here in Ross Carberry, he said that they were so highly regarded that he attributes the fact that they had escaped out a back window and made their way to Clonakilty was down to the fact that they were um, well regarded in the town compared to the RIC in many other towns at that time as things heated up in West Cork. Young Charles Henry Bowles had been born in Tynemouth. He was a young switchboard operator who had joined the RIC and was apparently sent here to Roscarbury in July 1920, that is, less than a year before his death. His parents, Arthur Bowles and Georgina Matheson, had an interesting love story. They were married in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The family had moved to England, where his mother died in July 1920, two weeks before Charles Bowles left for Roscarbury. And then we come to Ambrose, and I might go into a little bit more detail on my uh, granduncle. Ambrose O'Shea, sometimes in the documents, the O is dropped. That often would happen, as I see in the archives a lot. Um, he was from Wicklow. He joined the RIC in 1895, and he moved to West Cork with his wife, Christine, Christina, my grand-aunt, Chrissy, who, who was a shield from Limerick, and their three young sons, Gerard, Ambrose and Cyril. Ambrose loved to play piano, often on Sunday mornings, we are told he would be heard playing the piano um, in the beautiful Mariner's Row, the row of Coast Guard houses in Baltimore, where they had set up home and were bringing up their, their young family. When the War of Independence broke out in 1919, Ambrose put in for a transfer back to Dublin. He considered it a safer option than the tinderbox of West Cork. There's one very sad story that he was due to go to Dublin the day after the attack, but we will never know for sure. He was our mother's uncle and married to my grandmother's sister. We know that as an RIC officer, his daily work involved routine police duties, and Dan, my brother, did a lot of research on this. In March 1917, for example, at Skibbereen Petty Sessions Court, he testified in the trial of a group of people for larceny from a stricken seamer, the Alondra, which had sank, been sank, sunk off uh, Baltimore with the loss of 17 lives at Christmas time in 1916. Two years earlier, nearly two years earlier, he was involved in the aftermath of a much greater ocean tragedy when he gave evidence at the coroner's court in Skibbereen on the discovery of seven bodies from the Lusitania that were found and recovered by a Shirkin Island vessel. Uh, as we know, of course, the Lusitania had been torpedoed and sunk uh, by the German U-boat uh, off Kinsale with the loss of more than a thousand lives. One of the deceased had a gold watch which had stopped at exactly half past two, the moment of the attack of the Lusitania. Um, he'd also found uh, among these people there, were, there was a mother of pearl toothpick and various other uh, personal belongings and it was Ambrose's job to get those back to the owners of the Lusitania, the Cunard line. After his body was recovered from the barracks, Ambrose was interred in Russ Carberry Cemetery, but we believe his remains were later moved and reinterred in Tulla, the little beautiful cemetery at the water's edge in Baltimore. Chrissy and his sons left West Cork, never to return. And one of his sons, Cyril, two of his ch three children, um, Robbie and Anne are with us today and Anne is going to say a very brief word in a moment. Ambrose not only has no gravestone, we don't even know for sure where he is. And if he is in Tulla, he's in an unmarked grave, possibly buried in secret, given the sensitivities of the time. There is a register, though, for uh, uh, there's an entry for a young infant, his infant son, Kevin Percival, who we've only just discovered anything about him. He died a year before Ambrose. I'm nearly there, folks. Thank you for bearing with me. Jermac, my father's uncle, the dauntless man, never returned to his studies. He joined our new fledgling police force in Dublin, but he ended up emigrating to the USA, still in his mid-twenties. 
He worked as a hospital orderly. Uh, we have missing 30 years, the next 30 years of his life, we know nothing about, except that just as he was about to return to West Cork in the 1950s, having written letters to his family, he was run over by a tram in Trenton, New Jersey, and died instantly. Tom Barry, who had taken the other side from him in the Civil War, led the cortege to his funeral back to West Cork and made the graveside oration. To round it up, my brother Dan and I, as we were growing up and hearing about Jeremac, the dashing, dauntless man, we found an old gun in a, a, a bookcase at home. We found it really kind of fascinating. But we'd heard nothing about Ambrose O'Shea. In fact, we'd holidayed, you know, long way from our holiday, for, on our holidays from Skibbereen to Baltimore and out to Cherkin. We passed Tullis Cemetery every day as kids. We heard nothing about him. In doing our research, that began to change. We began to get more and more interested in and have more and more empathy for Ambrose O'Shea, who died here behind me. We want to know about him. We want to know about his life, his story. We want to find his grave and we want to mark it. We want to remember him and to remember all those who died as a result of the events here on March the 31st, 1921. Thank you very much. And um, my cousin Anne is just going to very briefly say a very quick word. I twisted her arm. <laughs> Thank you, Flora. Good evening. As the granddaughter of Ambrose O'Shea, this is a very special day for me and for my brothers, Robbie and Richard. Robbie, who is here. Sadly, we never knew Grandad, but seeing his name and being remembered makes him all the more real to us. Commemorations mean different things to different people, and for us, it's a huge honour to be here today. Ambrose died in the line of duty. He was just doing his job, which was to provide for his wife and three small children. One of those small children was my dad. May all those who lost their lives here rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Now I call on... Uh, where are we now? I call on Mayor Cochrane now to say a few words, and after that we'll do the unveiling. Dios Marie Vicarda, Nach Wilshe Gahaling of Anshai, Rosa Garbra, Agasan Green Egg Tanavering, Agasan Law, Starul Shah, Akamora, Agase Queenu, Ernadini, Atal Marav. Skurv Magav as Octan Quira, Toshe Mar Onor of Anshah. So good evening, Reverend Fathers, <coughs> Superintendent Omani, Guard Historian Jim Hurley, members of the Ruscarbrian District Historic Society, members of the Defence Forces, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honour to be here to join with you today, especially the descendants and the relatives for whom we are here to commemorate and remember. Cork County Council, through its Commemorations Committee, and the County Cork Commemorations Grant Scheme, supported the undertaking of this plaque by the Ross Carberry and District Historical Society. And I'm very proud uh, of our councillors and of their budget to be able to support communities in doing this very important work. The Society has an excellent track record in local heritage projects and commemorations and in recent years commemorated the centenary of the passing of Feeney and Jeremiah Donovan Rossa, a man that inspired so many at home and abroad in the quest for Irish independence. The period from 1916 to 1923, spanning the Easter Rising, the Anglo-Irish War of Independence and the Irish Civil War, saw the death of over 500 people in Cork, in Cork County. Men, women, children, on both sides of the conflict, and on none. Our history is not, and should never be viewed in just black and white. There are layers upon layers, and multitudes of intricacies and nuances. But quite simply, when there is loss of life, there is a calling on us all today to commemorate and remember particularly those, that, those events that resonate still with us today, such as the attack and explosion here at Ross Carberry in March 1921, and everyone here today is welcome. 
particularly the descendants of those who had passed away and who had involvement. And that's very important. These are inclusive ceremonies. As has been mentioned, our president has led the way on that, that we would have inclusive remembrance and uh, Machnev Maradoruk. The well-being of society can often be determined by who, what and why we commemorate. And every credit is due to the organising committee here in arranging this event where we have joined collectively to remember our past together. And the plaque we will later unveil will remember five people. They have been mentioned earlier, but I think as Mayor of the County, I want to call out their names and remember and testify to their role in Irish history. George Allen Wilson was aged 27. He was from Derry in Ross Carberry. Cornelius Francis Fitzpatrick was aged four from the square in Ross Carberry. Patrick Collins, aged 60, Derry Duff, Ross Carberry. RIC Sergeant Ambrose O'Shea, aged 46 and RIC Constable Charles Bowles, aged 22. Throughout the country, we are commemorating these significant events and moments from our past. And as set out in the government's official guidance and commemorations, the involvement of local communities is key. Here in Ross Carberry, I salute the Ross Carberry and District Historical Society, who have led by example, and I'm sure will continue to do so. Er yesh de gorev anamnaka nadini atom marav agas ata imaha rowing gor mago vorish asakt vor ara agas ve an shainov toshi taktok agas toshi ana haktok gor fad fekem pashti in our mask toshi taktok a queen og shivsha children you will remember today and you'll remember the importance of how of remembering your past and you'll bring that into the future so ganari gigalev agas gorev mila mago. Now, we're going to ask uh, Con O'Callaghan to lay a read on behalf of everyone here. Con is our treasurer with the society, but his father is one of the attacking party that night. So, like, it's, it's not real history yet. I meant to mention we have Nancy Fitzpatrick. She was a sister of the young guy who was killed in the attack. So, so Con, uh, Stand up, please. Stand up. Mellor <laughs> Bottom, Cortez! We'll just pause there for a moment. Just remember the people who died. Thanks, Peter. Remember the people who died in the attack. Well, it's all those who died during the period of 1914 to 1923. But also think about the people in Ukraine at the moment with the brutal war that's going on there. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'd have to R on the beam. Troll 
Now the colour party will now leave the parade. Well, Robotic. Yes. Well, Robotic. Hey, Astrid. Father McCart will now bless the plaque. And in this moment, we will remember all who died so tragically. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Fresh and green are the pastures where he gives me repose. Near restful water, he leads to my drooping spirit. He guides me along the right path. He is true to his name. If I should walk in the valley of darkness, no, no evil would I fear. You are there with your crook and your staff. With these, you give me comfort. You have prepared a banquet for me in the sight of my foes. My head you have anointed with oil. My cup is overflowing. Surely goodness and kindness shall follow me all the days of my life. In the Lord's own house shall I dwell forever and ever. God of mercy and compassion, we entrust all who lost their lives to your love. By your cross and resurrection, you have redeemed them to the world. Help us now find peace and consolation for all family and fresh. Treasure their memories of their, and we thank you for the blessings you brought upon us on this day in remembering our loved ones. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Thank you, Father. Now in, we're nearly finished. Now I'd like to thank Mayor Coughlin, Cork County Council. I'm oh, you can, sorry, you can take a seat again. <laughs> Cork County Council, in particular, Corner Nelligan of the Heritage Section. I'd like to thank Superintendent O'Mahony, Guard Vincent Hurley, the local guard, and all of his predecessors who've been keeping us safe for the last hundred years. I'd like to thank Larry Dunn from OPW for having the spa station looking so well today. And thank Eugene Murphy for his patience with me in the design of the plaque. And I thank Elaine for her rendition of Hour on the Veen and Ruth Fortune for the read. I'll thank Bert Kerisk for the chairs from St. Mount St. Michael. We'll drop them back later. I want to say a big thank you to my committee, without whom this event, this event would not have been possible. Finally, thank you all for coming here today. Thank you. Our next talk is April 28. Bob Jackson will be speaking on the Dr. Sword. It's about Dr. McCarthy and his captivity under the Japanese. You know, McCarthy's bar in Castletown Bear. That's 8 o'clock, April 28, in the Celtic Ross. If anybody's interested, there's a walk tonight following the footsteps of the volunteers. You can talk to myself or any of the committee for details, but they'll be walking in from Cashel. They'll be meeting up there around 11.30 tonight and walking in. It's about uh, an hour's walk on road. If you're interested, you can talk to us afterwards. And thank you all for coming. Now, that, that concludes everything. There'll be light refreshments down the Celtic Ross. If any, all are welcome. So you can make your way down to the Celtic Ross. And thank you and safe home. Thank you.
Well, uh, the only th first time I heard about this whole incident was, it was Mammy was saying about uh, Uncle John wanted to take Frank out. And Graham said, all right, but don't go down to the barracks. Go up the town. On the day. On the, On day. the day. Of course, where did he go? Only, Only where all the action was. Yeah. And they're all curious and... Fairly so typical of a young fellow, I suppose. At the time. She was. She was. She, she, she must have been a baby. She, she, she was only a couple of months old. She was 21. She was born she in. Been a baby in she was born in July 21, and it happened in. Um, that, oh, April so. 21. Alright. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. she was. Yeah. She was yeah. only two lads, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such a, that's true. So. So. Um, yeah. Peg was the eldest, sorry, yeah. yeah. Very tough on the grandmother, my grandmother, like a, you know, she never ever spoke about it. Never, never spoke ever about it. Yeah, yeah. But uh, reading about it, they, they, they had to get a, a train to Cork, like, no, she thinks an ambulance or a yeah. special car, even. Yeah, train from Clan. Train, going to Clan, get a train, no, and then get a taxi. Oh, a car to Clan. Is it a Hudson car? No, the way in. Yeah. Jeez. But, um, no wonder they never spoke about it after, I suppose, because look, they were so traumatised and everything. Yeah. Stomach injury, it was on the pit of the red somewhere there, was it? Yeah, in the, in, in the intent, intestines. Uh, but that whole generation just kind of buried the whole story. They did, yeah, that's how they dealt with things too, long ago. It was too yeah. raw to talk about it, yeah, and yeah. trying to deal with all the... Because it split families and it split communities and everything. I wouldn't have done a bit of one for you today. I wouldn't do that. Huh? No, no, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> But people don't talk about all things either that time. There were, there were no, no photographs from that time either. Wasn't there? You never see a photograph of that man? No. Didn't tell. Uh, oh, yeah. There's one of them over there. In New Orleans, I right, have there when you go. Oh, yeah. In a, a newspaper. Oh, the time that he died, was it? Or? No, well, it would be, I'd say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good evening, everybody. And thank you all for coming on this lovely day. It couldn't be better. And I'm delighted to see so many people. And I want to thank the organisers for organising this very special day because it's very special to me to have my brother and his pals remembered. It's very hard. It's very, uh, uh, it's very important to me. So. It was, a, it was a sad occasion, and it was an unfortunate thing to happen. I'm very thankful for everybody for coming. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Sarah Nee Wilson, my sister Mary Nee Wilson, and Judy, my brother Alan Wilson's uh, wife. Um, we're just really happy to be here today in this glorious sunshine. And... Um, like, I suppose every family has its tragedies and um, we've heard so many stories about this awful day that my grandfather was yeah. killed. Yeah. And um, my father was actually el only 11 months old when his dad was... And it had a terrible effect on my grandmother. Uh, me growing up, I used to remember her all the time wanting his headstone to be erected. And it left her bereft and very much on her own. And of course that affected, affected me as a child, but this is just lovely to have this now, because we don't know, really know. all to be honoured. Yeah. It's just so exciting for us. Um, I just wish that my father was here today to see it, and my, yeah. you know. Yeah. But like, we, we're honouring them, which is lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, it's just... and we'd like to thank everybody here that's involved in it, which is a lovely, lovely, lovely thing to do. And um, we're so proud. Absolutely, yeah. and it gives us it gives us an opportunity to find out more because we really don't yeah. know much about it, even though we know some. But yeah. this is just we're very grateful again, as Mary yeah. said. Yeah. So um, thank you to thank everybody involved. Involved, thanks. Yeah, I, I've heard my, my father telling me about the, the night that the column rested above in Cashel and Dunskirab and left there before midnight and marched down here and they came down through Raveline and down past Castle Salem and they were thinking of George Feely who was a prisoner that time with the oh. British at the time they were passing his home state in Raveline and they 
took off their, when they reached a mile outside the town, they took off their boots just in case of course, they'd yeah. make any noise. And they reached here in the town without anybody realising they were there. And it is interesting to note that when the bomb was placed on the shoulders of four men up around the corner here, that they had 70 seconds to come down here, place the bomb at the barrack door and get out to safety again. To safety again, again. well honestly. And there's but evidence... they were brave men. Isn't that? Isn't they were brave men, there's no doubt. And no there's evidence of the Mills bombs that the, uh, that the RIC were throwing out along the care bridge oh, there yes, yes, on yes. the footpath, oh, if you yes, study yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. So, That's it, God, yes. God, they were brave men though. Like they that they carried that thing that was live. The, the, it was going to explode and in it, 70 seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, that was brave. God, yeah. they were brave men. Brave men, there's no doubt about it. Um, our dad didn't want to have a headstone or a surround around the grave, and we only surmise that it is because his dad, Ambrose, was blown up. Yeah. Obviously, there was. We can't find his resting place now. Baltimore, and it is. Yeah, yeah we, but we, we can't. We, we actually we can't, can't find, find the actual yeah. uh, plot. But yeah. we're, we're working on that, and hopefully, yeah. uh, in time yeah. to come. And they are working on it down in Skibbereen and in Baltimore, and, and, the, yeah. uh, and trying to get the. Yeah. He was interred. The he, he was interred originally, yeah, and, then, and then moved on yeah. because That's the family, of course, were living in Baltimore at the time. The wife and three children. Yes. So he used to commute in and out for Baltimore. It would appear that would. We, yeah. we don't know. In, in to, or did he come up and do his duties and stay and then go back? We're not 100. Yeah. And then the fact that only in the last year we were able to erect a headstone for my father yeah. and now to see his father, our grandfather, to see his name here, it's a connection it for us. Connection, we yeah. never knew our grandfather and it's just, it's just a real connection and it's an honour to see him. In the line of duty, he did what he had to do. He and do and he's he's doing his job the same as other yeah. people yeah. are, you know. Yeah. So yeah. It's, uh, no, I find everybody hears about the big names like Michael Collins and Tom Barry, and but it's not the small there, people. There are so many small, yeah. smaller yeah. And people. And the tragedies that follow on and yeah. the lives yeah. of the people that follow on. Mm.